I think it's good to solicit feedback, uh, and particularly negative feedback. Why are you where you are in your life? The choices that you have made have been because of what you believe to be true for yourself. It's a great experience to be an entrepreneur. Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Mm -hmm. Living that believe in life. Out here living that believe in life. Every day we living that believe in life. Also like we living that believe in life. Living life, yeah, so we grinding it out. Every single day we be grinding it out. Also like we living that believe in life. Oh, that believe in life. Oh. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today let's live your best belief life and learn the seven lessons from Elon Musk, Oprah Winfrey, and other billionaires. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with lesson number one. Look for feedback with Elon Musk. I don't have a mentor per se, although I try to, I try to get feedback from as many people as possible. Um, and um, so I have, I have like friends and I ask them to, you know, what they think of this, that, that and the other thing and, um, you know, uh, as mentioned, you know, Larry's a good, Larry Page is a good friend of mine, value his advice a lot um, and um, I have many other good friends and uh, so, so I think it's good to solicit feedback uh, and particularly negative feedback actually because, you know, obviously people aren't, don't love the idea of giving you negative feedback. Um, unless, unless it's like some, you know, on, on, on uh, blogs, they, they do that. Rule number two, believe. Many of you, as I have been, as I am, are where you are in your life based upon what you believe. And it's not just what you think you believe on the surface, it's also your shadow beliefs that are holding you back from moving into the life that you believe you deserve. What I know is if you're not looking at the shadows, if you're not looking at what is subconsciously running through the tape in your mind, telling yourself you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, you're not smart enough, you're not enough, which is a tape that's playing for a lot of people. If you're not conscious of that, then you end up acting out of that belief system and not out of what you know to be the truest or want to be the truest for yourself. But you don't become what you want because so much of wanting is about living in the space of what you don't have. That's why Jim Carrey's story is so powerful because he started to act as though he already had it. He would go up to Mulholland Drive, he would drive away saying, thinking, I already have those things, I just haven't accessed them as yet. I believe those things are going to come to me and I'm going to act like they are, so I'm gonna move forward in my life in order to draw that to myself in such a way that my actions are in alignment with what I say I believe. So if you start to think about that, really, why are you where you are in your life? The choices that you have made have been because of what you believe to be true for yourself. Lesson number three, learn from mistakes with Jack Ma. It's a great experience to be an entrepreneur. Life is so cool when you become an entrepreneur. In my life, the day I never write a book for myself, I, I think those people who write books are getting too old. My life just the beginning. The day when I want to write, about, I want to write a book, I'll leave about 1,001 mistakes. And I want to tell my kids how many tough days I have grown through. How many mis silly mistakes I've made. And this is the best experience. This is, because it's easy to be good, but it's tough to be bad. In the first five years, Steve, in my company, I always giving the case studies of failure companies to every of my people. Today, the thing I want to share more with the young entrepreneurs is how many mistakes we made, how many companies bankrupted, why they bankrupted. I never teach like MBA teach people how they succeed, how that one success. When, you, when young people learn that too much, they think they can easily succeed. Going into business is like going to battlefield. The only those people survive win. And you know how to avoid stupid action. 
So when you learn the mistakes, the, the, the failure cases, not to avoid mistakes, but when you know, when you meet these mistakes, you know how to face it, how to solve it, how to challenge it. Lesson number four, lean into your fears with Grant Cardone. What do you think it'll take for you to get over insecurity moving forward? I'm not trying to, Is, man. You're not trying I'm to? I'm not trying to. I thought you said if you could get rid of it, you'd be able to do bigger things. be unbelievable, but, but it's, not, it's, not, it's not a target I have. In letting go of insecurity. No, I think it's just a human condition. I think it's part <clears throat> yeah. of the game. I think it's part of being a human being any more than I want to get rid of my arms, you know, right. or my <laughs> right. legs or my, my arms and my legs. My body, my body is a limitation. Yeah. You know, so... Um, how do you manage it better then? Like for people that are just, saying, I, you know, yeah. I want a 10X, but I always have insecurity and fear that I'm going to fail or people are going to show up and I'm, yeah. the deal is going to, I'm going to go broke. Yeah. How do you personally get, tell just, the conversation to yourself to the insecurity and fear? Yeah. It's not stop. It's come. You know, for me, for me, fear, fear, the things I, I'm scared of, I'm like, come on. You know, the, it, it, it's calling me. It says, hey, come play over here. It's an indicator, it's a good indicator, not a bad indicator. Lean into it. Lean into it, come play with me, okay? So I either have fear because it's really dangerous and stupid. Or like physically dangerous. Yeah, look, like, I'm gonna get to the edge of this thing, I'm gonna get on the other side of that thing, I'm probably gonna be scared. Yeah. Now, I, why, why am I gonna be scared though? Like, because I don't know what it feels like to fall, you know, this many floors and hit. Yeah. Maybe it does. Maybe there's no big deal about. It. Maybe dying's not even a big deal. Right. But I don't have the experience. I don't consciously have the experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I used to be like, I can't buy a seventy-eight thousand dollars house. I was terrified the first house I bought. I don't know what I'm doing. Because you don't have the experience. I don't have the experience, man. Yeah. This this is the problem, and you're not going to have the experience if you don't move through the fear. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do it once, and then they don't do it again. You got like. It's not going away. Yeah. It's just gonna, you're gonna get used to, you're gonna get used to the ski boots. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time you put them on, man, they're freaking banging your shins. Hurt. Like, I can't mend. But you just wear into them. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Good, how are you? You got a book coming out, don't you? Uh, you just came out. Where can people get it? Get it on uh, Amazon, easiest spot, built to serve, right there. Let's go, man. If you guys don't know Evan, follow Evan Carmichael. He's got a new book out, Build a Serve. Go grab it today at Amazon. Just a good dude right here. Lesson number five, focus on customer experience with Jeff Bezos. So anyway, we, we got this company just about ready to launch. And uh, we were looking at it, one, and looking at this little tiny fulfillment center. We were here by then in this building. We had a basement fulfillment center. To call it a fulfillment center was very grand. There's a lot of puffery. It was 400 square feet, um, which is about the size of a one-car garage. And we launched this uh, business, and we're looking at it, and we didn't know if anybody would order from us. We really didn't. And uh, in fact, one of the uh, software engineers looked at this little space, and he said, I can't figure out whether this is incredibly optimistic or hopelessly pathetic. Um, and indeed, we didn't know. We had no idea whether anybody would want to buy things in this way. The business plan called for uh, generating sales very slowly as customers changed their attitudes. The original business plan, which I thought was very optimistic at the time, called for Amazon.com to generate $70 million in sales in the year 2001. Um, we actually generated in excess of $3 billion in sales in the year 2001. And we knew, by the way, that we were really on to something in those first 30 days. In the first 30 days, we got um, orders from all 50 states and 45 different countries with not a dollar of advertising, just all word of mouth. In the first year, we didn't spend anything on advertising. All of it was word of mouth. And that really forged the company as a, that we were going to focus on customer experience because we saw the power of word of mouth so, so very, very clearly in those early days. There's something great about um, word of mouth online, by the way, and feedback from customers, which is that email turns off the politeness gene in the human being. It's wonderful. So people actually tell you what they really think, uh, usually in all caps. Um, and uh, so we get lots of uh, info and feedback from our customers, and we, and we try, to, try to use it well. Lesson number six, love what you do with Warren Buffett. How would you advise people who aren't necessarily going into a, a career field in which you would make a, a large base salary, such as like medicine or something like that, maybe um, performing arts or 
music, how would you advise us to keep up financially with the rest of the world? Well, it, there, it is true that a market system uh, does not pay as well in some in, in some activities as as might seem appropriate for the importance of those activities to society. Just take teaching, for example. I mean, teaching does not pay well. And what could be more important? I mean, I, you know, you've got to be as as interested in who your t the teachers of your children are as, as who your accountant is, or you know, uh, whatever, or who's winning the heavyweight title of the world, or that sort of thing. But but it doesn't it doesn't pay well. And and it's a fundamental choice uh, whether you're going to go into something. It, for many people, it'd be a it'd be a fundamental choice whether you're going to go into something you love or something to to try and make a lot of money. I think that generally it pays to go with what you love. And, uh, uh, I think that it's very hard to find people when they get to be my age who say they're on, that they've loved what they've done all their life and feel it was very worthwhile, uh, but they're terribly sad they made that choice because they didn't make a lot of money. I've, I, I don't think anybody's ever, ever said that to me, that they wish they'd gone into something else where they were uncomfortable doing it or didn't enjoy it, didn't feel very productive, but made a lot of money. So I don't, I don't think you'll find that. So I would, I, would, I would go to work, I would go to work in whatever turns you on. It may turn out that it'll, it'll be more profitable than, than you can think, but almost everybody here will make enough money, unless they get some terrible habits along the way, to do reasonably well. And, and doing reasonably well in this country really is, is, uh, is pretty darn good. I mean, it, it is, it's not necessary to have uh, huge amounts of money in order to enjoy yourself. I enjoyed myself when I was had my ten thousand dollars, and I live in the same house that I lived in when I was making it. When I had about that, I bought it forty one years ago. I liked the house then. I like the house now. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a reasonable job, you'll be eating at McDonald's, and I'll be eating at McDonald's. So we're we're to push on 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 food. I mean, you know. I hope, in fact, I hope it's Dairy Queen actually, and maybe may, at. Um, <laughs> Uh, and if you come to Dairy Queen, you'll see me. And you can order anything on the menu I can order, and we'll, we both can afford it. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll wear the same clothes I wear. I, I'll pay more for my suits, but as soon as I put them on, they look cheap on me. So we'll, we'll look about the same. And, uh, uh, we'll both live in the same kind of houses. I live in that house from 41 years ago, and it's, 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 it's warm in winter, and it's cool in summer, and it's comfortable. And you'll live in a house that's, that's similar. And, it, and what difference does it make if you have 50 more rooms or, you know, guest houses or all that? It, you know, it'll probably just bring you problems. I mean, you have to worry about the, about the uh, greenskeeper or something when you get through. So I, I, I have been in the houses of people uh, where the houses are worth, um, oh, probably 200 times uh, what my house is worth. And I would not be any happier in those houses at all. In fact, I'd, I'd be less happy. I just have one more thing to to worry about and you know the dozens of people around the place and people quitting and people stealing from you and all kinds of things to hell with it yeah uh, we drive we'll drive the same kind of car in fact you'll probably drive a better car I drive a car that's about eight years old I don't know what it's worth now but it gets me around fine I mean I, I'm perfectly happy we'll, we'll watch we'll watch the same television you know we'll, we'll work on the same computer pretty much the only difference will be how we travel long distances you know I will fly in a plane that's more comfortable than, than flying Southwest Airlines or something, which uh, I've got nothing against. But uh, that's the one real big difference. And other than that, I do what I like every day. I hope you, you'll do what you like every day to do. And uh, I work with nice people. I hope you work with nice people. Uh, and that's, there's 24 hours in the day, and those are where the hours go. So great wealth uh, is the tiniest bit different. Uh, in a real sense than having just a decent, a decent income. And, uh, and to trade a decent income and something you love doing and something where you feel worthwhile doing it for huge wealth where you trade off a lot of your principles uh, would be a terrible mistake. And lesson number seven, the last one before a very special bonus clip is think about the future with Bill Gates. When you have a tragedy like this pandemic, there is always the possibility you're going to narrow your community that you care about. You're going to think about yourself or your family, not the whole country, including those who've been 
been somewhat left behind. Likewise, there's a risk looking at Africa and other developing countries and saying, no, we need to help them out because difficulties there of not enough food are, are really extreme and small amounts of the budget, less than 1%, can help them out. Likewise, you don't want to just think about the here and now, you also want to think about the future. After all, the government failed us by not anticipating this pandemic. There were voices like mine in uh, TED Talk and other venues that kind of said, hey, get ready. We don't know when, but it's coming. Sadly, that didn't happen. Another thing we trust government to get us ready for is climate change. That's coming and it won't be as easy as creating a vaccine to solve it. And so right now, in terms of people's sympathy being broad, you know, being willing to address other problems even though they're not here right now, I am actually seeing a lot of positive voices. People saying, make sure the recovery is a green recovery. Europe has done a lot on that. And so, and actually the dialogue in politics about, you know, does climate change matter is stronger today than it's ever been. So this closing in and only worrying about the short term, I'm not seeing that. Of course, your audience, which is very young, will be the key to saying, Let's not just look at this short term. Let's start the investments that deal with inequities. Let's start the investments that can make sure climate change doesn't come in and, and have even more tragic results than this pandemic does. Young people thinking about policies, getting involved. I think I'm seeing an uptick. I hope that's sustained because they're, you know, they're the ones who will really do the innovative work. Now I've got a very special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you get motivated, inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through. But when you get motivated, inspired, and you create a plan of action, you have a over 90% chance of following through. And when you share it with other people, it jumps to 95% chance your likelihood of following through. And so I want that to be you from this video. We don't just watch videos here at Belief Nation. We do something, we take action. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below because I wanna celebrate you. During my California springs and summers, I spent most of my days in the high Sierras in Yosemite Valley working as a river guide and a rock climbing instructor. I loved those jobs, but unfortunately, they didn't pay that well. So I also got a job working a couple of days a week as a computer programmer back in Berkeley. I had learned to program in college. I didn't love programming, but it was fun and I was good at it. And computer progr programming gave me the same kind of satisfaction as solving math problems and playing chess. Both things I enjoyed before I became a confused teenager. At this point in my life, I thought I was making real progress on my journey of self-discovery. I had found a cause. I had a couple of jobs that I loved and one that was fun and paid the bills. I was pretty happy with my life. My wife was not. What she saw was a college dropout who spent too much time in the mountains doing foolish things. She wanted me to work full-time as a computer programmer or go back to college and finish my degree. We compromised, sort of. I started taking classes at UC Berkeley. I took several classes, but the only one I can remember was a sailing class taught at Berkeley Marina. Once again, I fell in love and began a lifelong affair with the limitless, omnipotent Pacific Ocean. When my class was over, I wanted to buy a sailboat. My wife said this was the single stupidest idea she had ever heard in her entire life. She accused me of being irresponsible, and she told me I lacked ambition. She kicked me out. And then she divorced me. This was a pivotal moment in my life. <laughs> the 
My family was still mad at me for not going to medical school. And now my wife was divorcing me because I lacked ambition. It looked like a re reoccurrence of the same old problem. Once again, I was unable to live up to the expectations of others. But this time, I was not disappointed in myself for failing to be the person they thought I should be. Their dreams and my dreams were different. I would never confuse the two of them again. If you want seven more amazing lessons from billionaires, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. I find if I don't get enough sleep, then I'm, I'm quite grumpy. Um, I mean, obviously, I think most people are that way. Um, and, and, and also, um, like I try to sort of figure out what's the right amount of sleep.